Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining today. Um, firstly, can I just say that I do hope that everybody is safe and well in obviously these uh, difficult trying times, but uh, really appreciate you taking the time uh, to join us today for um, our session on um, uh, tax and managing tax in, um, for your cash flow, et cetera, um, uh, through C19 and beyond. Um, by way of introductions, uh, my name is David Britton, and those that don't know me, um, I lead our banking tax practice here at BDO. Um, and today we'll be um, going through a number of taxes and um, privileged to be joined by other colleagues with me, and you'll hear from them um, at different points today. Um, we're joined by Carrie Rutland and our R&D team, Claire Murray um, in, in employment taxes, Ben Henton in transfer pricing, and Vicky Weston in our VAT team. Um, just a, a few things to, to before we start in terms of the presentations. All your lines are on mute. Um, so if you have any difficulties hearing us or, or any other technical difficulties, please put um, please put your comments in the Q and A box at the bottom right hand side of your screen. Equally, we do welcome questions, and please do raise questions as you go along. We will um, we will answer those at the end, and if we do not have time, apologies, but we will get back to you and answer them separately. Um, the session today should last around about an hour. And one other thing to note is that uh, this session will be recorded or is being recorded and we will be distributing the recording and slides as well afterwards, just in case there's any issues there as well. So if, first of all, we uh, are going to be joined by Carrie um, and she's going to be talking about um, R&D and how um, in this current world, R&D can really benefit you in terms of cash flow. And for those that haven't made a claim before from a banking uh, perspective, it's really worth listening to this as you, you may be able to, to see some real benefits that you could, you could derive. So if I hand over to Carrie now. Carrie, over to you. Lovely. Thank you very much, David. Um, so yes, I'm Carrie Rutland. I'm a director in the innovation and technology team focusing on financial services clients, so um, banks and fintech companies, um, because I worked in the industry for 15 years, um, trying to go back into practice um, to help companies access the valuable tax reliefs and incentives um, for innovation and technology. I'm conscious that a number of you will be familiar with R&D and the R&D tax credit regime, so I'm not going to go into that in too much detail. I'll do a little bit of a recap of the basics and then talk about some banking um, considerations at the current time. And then the latest from HMRC, um, because BDO sits on the R&D Consultative Committee um, and so is talking to HMRC on policy matters and process matters um, quite regularly. So if we just look at the basics, um, uh, the R&D um, tax credit regime is a government-backed regime where companies can get cash financing and cash funding for um, projects that they're doing which are designed to seek an advance in science or technology and resolve technical or scientific uncertainties. And that's quite a bit of a mouthful. Um, what does it mean in practice for banking fintech companies if you're working on a software project and there are areas of complexity where you can't readily sort of find the solution that isn't on um, Stack Overflow or any of the other sort of software forums, so you have to go through an iterative um, development process in order to find that solution, then it's likely that components of that project will qualify for R&D. So it's that those head-scratching, whiteboarding moments where you're actually trying to find a solution. And it doesn't need to be particularly groundbreaking. It can be things like integrating two systems or two off-the-shelf packages that don't naturally speak to each other. It can be regulatory changes which require systems development. So there are a lot of activities that will actually qualify. There are two regimes um, based on the size of the company or the group. Um, one is for companies, SMEs, who have less than 500 employees in the worldwide consolidated group and the other is for large companies. And the rate of, spend, the rate of benefit um, that you can get um, depends on whether or not you're an SME or large. 
Um, at, the, at the top end for loss-making SMEs, you can get back a third of your qualifying spend in cash. Um, if you're a large company, you get back about 10%. Um, and it's reported in pre-tax earnings, so it's quite attractive because it helps boost EBITDA. Um, so particularly if you're sort of P-backed and you're preparing for an exit or something like that, then actually that increase in EBITDA, um, or if you've got reporting sort of hurdles, is really quite um, attractive. So in terms of um, C19 and what we're seeing at the moment, um, we're seeing a lot of companies and a lot of banks and financial services institutions actually have a look at, again at their R&D claims and thinking about um, are they um, optimizing those? So are they sort of claiming for the most that they um, possibly can in a robust fashion that is going to stand up to HMRC scrutiny and be paid out promptly? Because this helps cash flow and it also helps earnings. A number of institutions are having to make systems changes because, for example, their risk models are having to change because of these sort of unprecedented times and the fact that all the historic data is no longer valid. And those systems changes as a result of the risk modeling or other sort of um, trading opportunity models will often be complicated. There won't be any available solution in the marketplace and will qualify as R&D. So any systems work that you're doing at the moment that C19 related is likely to have a qualifying element and is worth looking at. Um, R&D claims have to be made within two years of the end of an accounting period. Um, so theoretically, if you're a December year end, you can still make a claim for 2018, um, December year end. But actually, if you can bring forward your R&D claim and you've got your accounts and your tax comps ready, then you can access that cash that comes with it earlier. So again, we're seeing a number of um, companies really pull forward their R&D claims in their tax computation process to access that cash. Um, companies, banks are also looking back at their um, projects over the last two years and, and for example, where they only claim for these sort of really innovative blue sky thinking projects historically, they're asking us to have a look at another project, have a conversation with their IT staff and say, actually, are there components of that project which also qualify? Can we go back and amend a historic claim to access benefit that we're absolutely entitled to and that we just didn't claim at the time for sort of probably speed reasons? So that's really what we're seeing in the market. In terms of HMRC, um, as I mentioned, this is a government-backed incentive. The government wants to encourage jobs innovation in the UK, um, and they're very committed to the um, regime. So if you take the, the middle bullet point, they're still paying out claims within 28 days of submission. So when I talk about so accessing cash fast, this is a very good way to do it if you submit an R, a robust R&D claim with all the supporting narrative that you need to. Um, R&D claims must still be included in a tax comp and submitted with annual accounts. There's been a sort of rumours in the market about whether or not you could get away without putting it in a tax comp or submit provisional with, um, claims, but it still needs to go in in a, in a tax comp with accounts. Um, if you or any of your clients um, have entered into time to pay arrangements, if you're a large company, so more than 500 employees, and you make an R&D claim, then HMRC has absolutely no discretion. That R&D claim will be used to offset any amounts under the time to pay arrangements. If you're an SME, then HMRC does have some discretion. So if you've entered into a time to pay arrangement or your client has, and they're going to submit an R&D claim, have an upfront conversation with um, HMRC, because if the if the client thinks they're going to access cash and actually all it's going to do is offset another HMRC liability, they, they want that conversation up front to actually sort of continue to receive that cash flow benefit. So that's a, just a quick canter through the R&D regime and what we're seeing at the moment. I'm very happy to take questions afterwards or um, if you want to drop me an email, um, then that would be great too. Okay, I shall now pass on to um, Claire Murray, who's covering employment taxes. Thank you, Carrie. Um, well, good morning. I'm Claire Murray, a director of BDO's Global Employer Services team. 
Um, I specialise in a UK employment tax, but within the team, we have specialists in expatriate matters and also share plans and incentives. And between us, we can advise on the plethora of employee related matters which banks may need to consider. This morning, I'm going to cover a few topics which have not perhaps been afforded the press coverage um, as some of the key COVID 19 measures, but are nevertheless the topics which we are being asked about in consequence of the current situation. For employees, lockdown typically meant one of two things. Either the location where they are working has changed, as they are now probably working from home, or if they've continued to attend their usual workplace, so for example in retail banking, there are challenges in reaching that workplace safely. This is particularly relevant here in London, where using public transport is the norm. So we've had a number of questions about the consequence of banks paying for travel costs, such as fuel or congestion charges, to enable employees to drive to work rather than use public transport, or paying for hotel accommodation near the workplace so that travel can be limited. To date, there have been no announced changes to the usual legislation which applies to travel to or accommodation and subsistence provided at the employee's permanent workplace where the costs are borne by the employer. The such costs will usually give rise to an income tax and NIC charge. The only exceptions are in respect of car parking at and near the workplace, for which there is an existing specific legislative exemption, so that's provided the car park is not in conjunction with um, a salary sacrifice arrangement, or if the benefit provided by the bank falls in the trivial benefits exemption. The trivial benefits exemption can only apply to items where the monetary value is less than £50. The benefit is not part of contractual terms or via a salary sacrifice arrangement. It's not cash or a cash voucher and is not in recognition of particular services. There are, these, you know, there are additional considerations for closed companies which I'm not going to cover today. So in principle, some travel or accommodation costs may meet the terms of the trivial benefits exemption. However, care should be taken regarding reimbursed expenses as HMRC is likely to be that they can constitute cash and therefore cannot be covered by the exemption. For completeness, it is worth mentioning there is also an existing legislative exemption which can apply to travel and accommodation paid from employers for their employees during a public transport strike. One of my colleagues has recently been in discussion at HMRC about the application exemption for accommodation actually provided to key workers in the NHS, and we were told by HMRC that the current situation does, does not fulfil the criteria of that exemption, so we would not suggest trying to utilise it. To the extent that costs are not exempt, in broad terms, when reimbursing tax expenses to employees, they will need to be processed by the payroll for PAY and NIC purposes. Whereas if the bank is arranging and paying for tax benefits, the benefit is reportable on Form PLMD. Um, and if the bank um, you wishes to bear the income tax and NIC costs, it should be possible to agree the inclusion of PAY Settlement Agreement, or PSA, on the basis of the costs are minor and irregular. And just to note, there's still time to and agree an amended PSA scope for the 2019-20 tax year, and this needs to be done by the 6th of July. So just a couple of weeks left to do that. HMRC have announced some changes in clarification for home working expenses. There was already an um, exemption from income tax and NIC for additional household costs incurred by employees which are paid or reimbursed by their employer as part of a formal working at home arrangement. Um, an employer can contribute up to £6 per week without receipts under this exemption. HMRC has clarified that working at home in consequence of COVID-19 constitutes a formal home working arrangement for this purpose. So that's quite helpful. There is also a separate income tax and NIC exemption for relevant equipment provided to employees to enable the employees to work from home, provided any private use of the equipment is incidental. So in response to COVID-19, the legislation has been temporarily amended with effects on the 11th of June 2020 and to the 5th of April 2021. This is to enable the exemption to apply to situations where employees are reimbursed for costs in procuring such equipment themselves. And HMRC have also confirmed that they will not pursue income tax and NIC for costs reimbursed um, during the period 16th of March 2020 to 11th of June 2020, provided all those other conditions um, were met. And as mentioned, to the extent that the exemption conditions are not met, it should be possible to include the expenditure in the scope of the PSA or agree a PSA um, to, to include them. 
Um, the final point was um, around the expenses and so forth was in respect of screening tests for COVID-19. So, so no new legislation has been announced, but there is an existing income tax and NIC exemption for one annual health screening per annum. And to extent this has not already been used for more than one COVID-19 test is provided, the cost may qualify for the trivial benefits um, exemption. If not, it should be possible to include the cost in the PSA if you do not want your employees to suffer an income tax charge. So as I've just outlined, there are quite a number of things to think about from a UK domestic perspective. And the situation can become quite complex when internationally mobile employees return to their home countries and are working there um, during lockdown, so-called displaced employees. So internationally mobile employees can encompass a number of situations, such as formal secondment, those who transfer on a local hire basis, and employees who commute cross border, all of which have complexities irrespective of COVID-19. We would usually dissuade our clients from having international work at home arrangements because the presence of those employees in an overseas jurisdiction can trigger income tax, social security and payroll obligations for the employer in the country where the employee is working. And again, this typically adds complexity and time and cost to the employment arrangements. The consequence of displaced internationally mobile employees are, however, that banks may suddenly have a number of employees who are effectively working at home on an international basis. The OECD has recommended that countries around the world implement measures to deal with the displaced employee situation and not seek income tax or social security, which might ordinarily arise. So some countries have announced um, some relaxations to current legislation, including the UK. But care will need to be taken in terms of the circumstances of when and during what time frames the relaxations can apply. And if employees do not return to the UK or indeed leave the UK once travel restrictions are lifted, there may be income tax and social security consequences. So at this stage, it's important to gather information about where employees are currently working and understand announcements on um, income tax and social security relaxation in those countries so the consequences can be planned for. Um, if employees do not immediately move back to their usual country of work, so where employees will not be returned to their usual country of work by the end of this month, we would recommend that employers discuss with their tax advisor so they can um, advise on which of the priority cases to be reviewed for tax and social security implications. And in the longer term, more employees may well ask for international working from home agreements as working arrangements generally become perhaps more flexible. But the income tax, social security and payroll consequences will need to be fully considered as well as the impact at a corporate level and the corporate presence in a particular country before agreeing anything. And um, there are naturally other considerations such as employment law. In terms of specific announcements for employers, the filing deadline for the annual short-term business visitors agreement or STBC agreement um, report has been extended from the 31st of May to the 31st July for the 2019-20 tax year. With a quick reminder, an agreement should be entered into and business visitors tracked where any business visitors come to the UK, so even for one day, otherwise strictly PAY should be operated. And that's irrespective that the employees are paid outside of the UK. And there are certain situations which may not be covered by an agreement and where the PAY obligation um, remains, such as non-resident directors, visitors from non-treaty countries, or visitors from overseas branch, the UK country. I'm not going to get into that detail um, today. And uh, whilst you're not aware of a significant redundancy programmes in the banking sector, I thought it was also helpful to flag the recent change in the termination payment legislation, as it is easy to overlook given the, given the huge number of announcements recently. So from 6th of April 2020, an employer Class 1A NIC charge via payroll now applies to qualifying termination payments in excess of £30,000. This follows obviously a number of changes to the termination payments uh, legislation in recent years and said so it's very easy to overlook given all that is happening. And finally, I've deliberately not covered the coronavirus job retention scheme or bonus deferral. So whilst we have had many client discussions on these topics, they've typically not been in the banking sector. But if you do need any support with these areas, there is um, a lot of information on our COVID-19 hub on our website, or please do get in touch with me or your usual um, BDO contact. And with that, I will hand over to Ben.
Yeah, hello. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Ben Henson. I'm a director in the transfer pricing team, uh, focusing on financial services. Um, prior to BDO, I worked in house uh, 15 years at uh, various uh, global banks. Um, I mean, COVID obviously is uh, having a massive impact on uh, the normal trading norms for all organisations, uh, including uh, you know, those in banking. Um, and one of the significant topics or significant issues that, that many banks are like to face that uh, are conducting a lending business is, is impairments. Um, and you know, we've seen some of the major UK banks announce very large impairments uh, so far. And uh, sadly, uh, you know, there is a, an expectation that that may well continue, certainly uh, in the short term. Um, and we, with, with loan impairments, they can be very significant. They can be very visible in the tax return. Uh, often there will be a, a line item in the, in the tax return or in the tax computation setting out the impairment. Um, and really wanted to highlight some of the issues you should be thinking about to the extent that they uh, become a reality. Uh, with uh, loans, there can be some question marks as to where they are attributable for tax purposes. So during the financial crisis, we saw a lot of uh, loan losses being recognised around the globe. And during that time, we also faced lots of challenges around where those losses potentially might sit for tax purposes. Now, during the course of COVID, there could also be some very different ways in which you could operate. So decisions around uh, loans and, and the like and, and credit control could actually be different to the normal trading norm. But in the UK, you need to be very conscious about the decisions that are being made around loans and your normal trading model and, and documenting that to support any significant loan impairments. So often where a significant loan impairment is recognised, HMRC can ask about the details in respect of the loan. So, for instance, is it very clear that the loan was originated and approved in the UK? Does the UK have the requisite staff? that have the expertise and the knowledge to look at the loan and make a decision about granting the loan in the first place. And then on an ongoing basis, where is credit monitoring done? Where is the loan serviced on an ongoing basis? And it's surprising you can get loan books that run for a very long time where the fact patterns aren't really very clear. And you know, in the event of inquiry from HMRC, in the absence of a clear paper trail or documentation supporting that trading opera, uh, those trading operations, you can face challenges around the deductibility of those loan impairments. And in the UK, there is specific legislation around the attribution of loan assets within banking, which sort of flags the importance of, of the issue. I mean, that is strictly applied to branches, but the statutory notes make it very clear that HMRC could, could potentially look at it in respect of legal entities and apply those principles more broadly. So, in terms of looking at significant losses within the COVID period, do think about what the trading model is and capture those key decisions associated with the ongoing sort of credit risk management of the loan book. And touching on some of the uh, the points we we touched on earlier by Claire uh, with globally mobile employees, we've seen many many expats returning to the UK during the course of the crisis. Some on a on a a temporary basis and some perhaps on a more permanent basis. But I think the longer they obviously remain in the UK, potentially the bigger impact that could have on your operating models. So within a uh, you know, global bank, if you've got you know, senior employees or front office employees that are moving back to the UK and they are part of a business which is applying transfer pricing, that could fundamentally impact, impact the mix of income or the mix of costs that you're looking to allocate um, during the year in respect of that business. Um, and unless you're sort of looking at those issues on a fairly contemporaneous basis, you, you, don't, want, you don't want to be facing uh, the task of looking at right at the year end uh, and assessing uh, the functional analysis to, to see whether your current transfer pricing is still actually relevant during the course of the COVID crisis. So things to consider things about the, the individual themselves and whether they are here on a permanent basis or whether they're just waiting for the crisis to end to move back because obviously we have got some OECD guidance around 
um, mobile employees and those that have returned to some jurisdiction on a temporary basis. But obviously, it's going to be far from clear and it's going to be specific to those individuals as to whether or not their intention really is to remain here indefinitely. And that, that can have a massive impact on the global allocation of income in, in respect of those businesses that they are working in. Um, and then finally, really, in terms of transfer pricing models across the group, the current trading conditions are obviously extremely stressed. They're not representative of the normal trading conditions that would have been assessed and analyzed as part of any existing transfer pricing that's in place. So it's very important, really, that during the course of this accounting period, you're thinking about whether or not there are any existing methods that really aren't commercial. Um, there'll be many methods across groups which might be providing a cost plus return with a margin to various services and guaranteeing a profit. Well, that might, might well, in the current crisis, be completely uncommercial. I mean, if you're providing a trade finance business with um, you know, a, a fairly chunky and healthy margin, um, it may not be realistic that that, that that is absolutely commercial in the current crisis. Is it the case that uh, you know, that, that uh, location should be making a loss or at the very least not receiving any kind of margin at all, particularly if they haven't really booked any business in, in the past three or four months? Um, so things like that are things to be actively considering because at the end of the day, it's the extent that you are going to amend your existing transfer pricing model during the course of the crisis those really have to be done in the current accounting period to get any cash tax benefit in terms of trying to manage your effective tax rate uh, in the best possible way for shareholders. And the other thing with the dynamic sort of situation we're in at the moment is we've seen significant changes to interest rates, significant changes to the way capital raising is being done within the market, which could have a big impact on some of the rates. So any TP methods which are of relying on certain um, returns to equity or cost of capital, it's worth um, considering the impact of the current crisis on those rates and whether or not um, you know, there's, there's a need to revisit those and, and put in a, some kind of ad hoc um, a solution to ensure that um, the TP that's being applied actually arrives at a commercial result. Um, and I think the, the one point to reiterate is I think, although you could argue uh, transfer pricing, you, you can deal with that after the end of the account period, you can deal with that with a tax return adjustment. I think in order to get cash tax benefit in terms of uh, any reductions of, of income being paid away from the UK potentially, it's worth considering in, in the current accounting period to ensure that um, you know, your filed tax return position continues to comply with the arm's length principle. And on that note, I'll hand over to Vicky, who's uh, going to be covering the AT. Director and BDO's London BAT team, working back for over 15 years, specialising in financial services with a banking focus, and within that sector, I've done a lot of work with fintechs. Um, I've also spent time working as a VAT manager in a global retail bank. So the majority of businesses in the banking sector can't fully recover that they incur on cost. So looking at ways to either minimise this cost or improve cash flow can be particularly valuable for this sector. So I'm going to spend about 10 minutes today giving the key areas to consider in relation to VAT and COVID, flagging potential cost savings and cash flow benefits, as well as some other areas, it's worth being well on. <clears throat> so, the first thing I'm going to mention is the deferral of VAT payments. I imagine most people on the call are pretty familiar with this scheme now. Um, it was introduced by the government earlier this year in response to C19. Um, it allows Taxpayers to the and payments, including payments on account and advanced annual accounts. Um, it has the effect of deferring payments until the end of March next year. So, all the 
uh, there are a couple of points that I wanted to add. Today. Um, if you wanted to use but you didn't manage to go through direct debit time, you can request HMRC apply the deferral retrospectively. And this can automatically offset the value of deferred payments against amounts that were due. And it can also be requested where HMRC has received assessment. Um, if you want time to pay beyond HMRC's time to pay arrangements, which I'll cover a little bit later. Yeah. Um, on the side, I'll just briefly mention making tax digital. Again, most people are more aware of this. Um, this is 2022 originally, which requires them to connect that records digitally. Um, that's now been extended, and the deadline now applies to the first fat return period starting on or after the 1st of April 21. Um, so this effectively means businesses now have more time to prepare and they can use the cash they would have spent on MTD for things which are currently a higher priority. So moving to the next slide, um, when you're looking at managing cash flows, a good place to is to, to check your house is in order. Um, a common area of opportunity for FS businesses on the output side uh, is to review that accountable under the reverse charge mechanism, and that's to see whether any of the bought-in services um, which are currently treated as taxable could potentially fall within of that exemption. Um, alternatively, there could be services which are just not within the scope of UK VAT at all. Uh, so, for example, we flagged here overseas land. So, you might have a cost that relates to land outside of the UK where you'd been accounting for VAT on that, and potentially it should never have been within the scope of UK VAT. So uh, a common area for the banking sector, um, this could apply to outputs and potentially reverse charge. Uh, and it's a subject of ongoing litigation is the payment processing exemption. So in addition to ensuring you're applying exemption to your bought in services, it's also worth considering whether treating your suppliers as taxable could present an opportunity. So. The, the, there are two sides to this, so it may be beneficial to treat your services as exempt, where the majority of your customers can't recover the VAT they incur as a cost, but where your client base can recover the VAT as a cost, then potentially charging VAT on your supplies um, could be the best thing to do. And this is something I've looked at lots of times recently. Um, where this is the case, it can be relatively easy to agree with H that, um, as you can imagine, uh, more robust for that than if you want your services to be exempt. Uh, particularly in light of, of the, the ongoing case law, which seems to be interpreting the exemption in an increasingly narrow way. Um, so there are a number of things to consider uh, when looking at this. So in addition to your customer fact recovery position, you want to check the contractual position on pricing. So if you charge your customers that, are you able to charge that on top of the, the net price that you're charging them? Um, again, that links into to the potential impact on pricing, where maybe not all of the customers can recover the VAT each, charge, and the potential for it to create some customer churn. So I, you know, will, will you lose customers if you start charging that on your services? So I move on to, to the other point on this slide. Um, in terms of the reverse charge, uh, the last thing to mention is in the age of the Swiss me in relation to branches of overseas entities in the UK tax uh, So this is particularly in relation to the establishment condition. I think many people will be aware of profile challenges. Hi, Vicky. I think we're having a few problems with your line at the moment. So if you want to mute and I, I'll take over on the VAT. Apologies, everyone, obviously, with, uh, with the technology uh, as we're dealing with these things. Um, I will, uh, I will, I will try to uh, uh, 
cover the uh, the VAT aspects, and then uh, uh, hopefully Vicky's line will improve for uh, for questions. Um, so I, 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 there was a, a couple of things in terms of um, I think you may have missed in terms of what Vicky was um, saying there. I think I'll just pick up and just in terms of the of the um, permanent establishment uh, uh, issues. And so just a couple of more points, just to flag briefly on this on this slide. Um, so the continued scrutiny that HMRC are applying to branches of overseas entities in the UK VAT groups. So. So this is really focusing on the establishment condition and also on the anti-avoidance uh, condition. So it's applying to certain services brought in to partly exempt VAT groups, which obviously uh, banks will be heavily impacted by. So one thing to, to think about is that if you have a VAT group registration where these points apply, um, it's worth kicking the tires just to get comfortable. You can repulsively defend any HMRC scrutiny. Um, yeah, we're seeing quite a lot of this. Obviously, um, that, that grouping and permanent establishment is not not anything new. But when you when you consider that, obviously, the amount of money that um, the, all of the governments are having to uh, to obviously uh, give to um, to us all at this moment in time, um, you will probably come under heightened scrutiny uh, in relation to anything that you do in relation to permanent establishment. And dare I say it, we can now not. We can now not have a uh, um, any presentation previously without mentioning Brexit. Um, now I don't think you can obviously have a presentation without mentioning Brexit and COVID-19. But obviously, with Brexit and the um, likelihood that most of you may have um, uh, more permanent establishments arising, this is this is particularly important. Um, just wanted to mention around the systems and data review. Um, so. What we see is that where this area is looked at is often results in easy wins for the business. So a common example being where the system automatically applies prudent rules for expense claims, meaning VAT is not recovered in cases where the business is entitled to recover. So over four years, this can add to a, to a not immaterial VAT repayment claim for you. So, so one thing to look at. And then another thing that I just wanted to flag is where businesses are entering into property transactions as a result of COVID. Um, so lease surrenders, for instance. So it's worth considering that VAT to ensure it doesn't result in an irrecoverable VAT cost where possible. So I'm just going to flick on to the next slide um, and just touch upon a couple of points here. Um, so, you know, obviously partial exemption is one thing that uh, it will probably be dear, dear to everyone's heart on this call. Um, but I just wanted to flag a couple of key COVID specific points, uh, which also ties in, dare I say it again, with Brexit. Um, so I think one thing that we are seeing is that uh, um, what a lot of people we would would uh, really encourage you to do is really try to look and revisit your parcel exemption method. Um, now this, is, this could be particularly important if you've seen your supplies change as a result of COVID. Um, so this could be an increased reduction or cessation of existing income streams, or, or it could even be the introduction of a new income stream. Obviously, um, having a look at whether things online are changing. So just how you how your overall business is being run, um, pre, during, and importantly post COVID. Um, but the one thing to note is that, as you'd be aware, businesses uh, need to update HMRC if there are any changes to their business affecting the agreed method. So and this is generally written into any partial exemption special method. So this is only on what we would call PESM. So if anyone's got a standard method at the moment, um, it may be worth looking whether a partial exemption method is better for you rather than using the standard method, especially if you think that your your income supply or your expenses are changing as a result of uh, COVID. Um, um, Many businesses, as I say, were probably already doing this as a result of Brexit restructuring, and and these things can be done alongside each other. So, as I say, C19 and Brexit, you got you got to go hand in hand with anything there. Um, there's also potential widening of the specified supplies order in a no deal Brexit scenario. Mm -hmm. Although there is legislation in place, meaning this will automatically um, will apply automatically to agreed peasants in the event of a no deal, it's good to be aware of the changes that should result 
in and maybe in cases substantially increase VAT recovery for UK businesses making specified suppliers to EU customers. So I'll just move on one more slide. So the last thing, um, last thing we just want to talk about on this slide, um, and it covers a sort of variety of options in order to manage your cash flows. Um, from a VAT perspective, there's a lot there, and obviously what we wanted to talk through with this presentation is not just um, uh, what the VAT rules are, but really the, the things that you can um, uh, that you can really look at for your cash flow. But I just wanted to focus on two key points here. So we've mentioned it before um, in Carrie's part around R&D, but time to pay uh, is a big issue. It, does, it, it essentially does what it says um, on the tin. It's an arrangement with HMRC to agree more time to pay tax due. Um, but it, it's not specific to VAT, and it covers others' taxes as well. Um, and if it, it's not, it's not also new. Um, time to pay arrangements have been there. Um, it's just obviously being used more now in the uh, COVID environment. Um, but with this, you should contact HMRC and agree uh, a time to pay arrangement with them. Um, it is still an obligation to pay. Um, so it's just a deferral or it is a, um, an instalment payment. Um, but they have been, when the first part of the COVID came in, when it was impacting us more, they were a lot more willing to similarly agree time to pay arrangements on the hoof and just accept any that were coming through. Um, as time has moved on, HMRC are starting to go a little bit more scrutiny around these. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention on the, uh, the slide um, it's just the last, the last second from bottom. Um, just wanted to flag this for anyone on the call who is an outstanding VAT repayment claim with HMRC. Um, what we're seeing is that we're aware that as a result of COVID and helping businesses with cash flow, HMRC have been agreeing to pay claims on a pay now, check later basis, where the amounts are below certain, well, undisclosed limits. Um, so if you have an outstanding repayment claim with HMRC, it's worth asking now whether they'd, they'd be willing to do this. This comes with a caveat that HMRC could potentially ask for the money back if they disagree with the basis of the claim when they review it at a later date. Now, those that know me on the call, and uh, they know that I'm not a, a VAT expert, but hopefully that's, uh, that covers uh, a number of the points on the on the VAT aspects, and hopefully we'll get some uh, some. Oh, well, I can see we're already getting some question questions around VAT. So hopefully Vicky's line uh, may have improved in terms of being able to answer those. Uh, but if if we can't, then um, we will uh, we will answer those separately. So that's it was a it was supposed to be a quick run through of those taxes that we see that can help you with the most beneficial in terms of cash flows or those that we're seeing with the most difficulty so or issues that may arise as a result so employment taxes being one and obviously the others where we can see that you can definitely get a uh, start to look at what the COVID impact is and the uh, the benefit of um, of the cash flows. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to just mention that isn't on the slides and wasn't covered today just because it's not really a cash flow uh, issue, but is a is a is an issue dear to to to, to the bank's hearts at the moment, um, and I'm seeing a lot more conversations around this over the past few weeks. It's just around uh, DAC six or the mandatory disclosure regime. Um, you're you're probably all aware in terms of the uh, DAC six requirements, and I'm not going to go for cover them today, um, uh, as we've I've covered them previously in other webinars, but. Those that are, are following this closely, uh, you may know that um, at the moment, the first reporting date was going to be, well, a, a transaction entered in through from the 1st of July, and the first reporting for the uh, interim period are going to be at the end of August uh, this year. Uh, you may be aware that the EU Parliament has voted for a deferral for three months on both the start date um, and also for the first um, interim reporting or the interim reporting date. Um, it's not coming to law yet. Uh, it still has a couple of hoops to go through, as we understand it, in the Parliament. Um, and um, then the local countries will, individual countries will need to vote and implement that into local law. Uh, it is fully anticipated that the HMRC will look to defer by three months in light of C-19. However, watch this space as nothing's been confirmed. So that's the only other thing I wanted to, to do. It's not necessarily a cash flow. Just one thing to to bear in mind uh, as an impact of C19 as things uh, has been deferred. 
Um, I, as I say, now is the time to, to ask any questions. We've had a few questions come in, but for those that haven't yet raised the questions or have a burning question they would like to ask, there is a question and answer um, a button at the bottom right. So if you can, um, if you can start entering any other questions that you have, um, uh, then then we will try to answer them. So um, we've got a couple of questions already. So let me just um, ask those, and I'll um, uh, I'll pass them on to the respective people. I think um, first one on R and D carry. So uh, let me just read this out to you. So, um, what's the biggest issue that you're seeing in relation to R and D claims at the moment? Okay, so I think R and D claims are sort of generally well understood in in the market and in banking companies. But one thing um, companies that were are unaware of is that in order to include any expenditure in a claim, um, that expenditure needs to be paid. So if you're entering into um, intra-group transactions, so for example, you've got a large development team sitting offshore. Um, if you leave that that um, invoice outstanding on sort of an intercompany account, so the offshore development um, company invoices the UK for R&D activities, um, and instead of settling that invoice in cash, you leave it on the intercompany account, you can't actually include that expenditure in the UK R&D claim. So it's important when you're thinking about your transfer pricing and your intercompany arrangements in light of C19 that actually if you want to include spend in an, in an R&D claim, it's got to be cash settled. And HMRC are sort of increasingly looking out and watching out for this. So they may ask to see um, invoices and remittance advices to demonstrate that that payment is in relation to the R&D. So it's worth thinking about that and planning for that if you're going to submit an R&D claim. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, that makes sense. I mean, on one hand, the, the government are obviously keen to, to provide cash flow to, to businesses in this troubled time, but they want to do so in the right way, it seems. Um, Claire, we've got, a, we've got a couple of questions uh, for you, actually, so if you don't mind. Um, so the first question is that you mentioned that for the exemption of home working costs to apply, the private use of any equipment provided must be incidental. Um, how do we know the amount of private use by employees? Um, that is indeed a good question. So obviously it is not possible to monitor the private use by employees or in their own homes. But luckily um, this is an area where HMRC's sort of approach is reasonably pragmatic. So what they expect is that employers Set out the circumstances when, you know, when private use may be made of equipment provided for business use. So this might be set out perhaps in the employment terms, conditions, or a specific policy. So obviously, therefore, they're limiting the use that employees are permitted under some sort of permitted use um, arrangement. So provided that's in place, that in itself should be sufficient. Obviously, if you, you suspect your employee is doing something different, that, that's kind of a, a slightly different question. But but that the policy itself or some controls should be sufficient to, to support the limited private use. Thanks, Claire. We, we've got a couple more questions actually, Claire, for you as well. Um, okay. As always, employment tax is always uh, gives, gives a lot of uh, interest to people. Um, so regarding short-term business visitors, what if someone is stuck in the UK due to the pandemic, where the initial plan was to visit for a couple of months? Um, does HMRC show any flexibility in these circumstances? Um, well, uh, as you probably gathered at the beginning, I'm not uh, an expatriate specialist, but in broad terms, um, so on the STBV agreement itself, I'm not aware as, as yet that any specific changes have been made in terms of the amount of time that can be spent in the UK, but obviously, even on the STBV agreement, actually quite a considerable amount of time can be spent in the UK, um, and you know, and people can still be within the regime. But typically, the longer they are in the UK, the more obligations there are on to, to meet, and also kind of in terms of reporting to HMRC. So it may be that even with extended time in the UK, actually they're still okay to be reported as, as, as STBV under the annual report. Um, it obviously depends how much time they've previously spent in the UK um, as, as well. 
Um, and then I guess more generally what HMRC have announced in terms of the UK tax residents is that they, they've said that being stuck in the UK due to um, COVID-19 is will be an extenuating circumstance for purposes of statutory residence test. So again, that may, you know, so it's, it'll be a you know, question of looking at those kind of various regimes and deciding what, you know, what the consequences are. So I'm afraid I can't give a specific answer, but I hope that gives some food for thought. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, and, and you know the other thing, the flip side as well with all of this as well is, and, and Ben mentioned it, is um, making sure that from a corporate tax point of view, um, understanding what the, uh, the hopefully they're of a short-term nature, but making sure that you don't inadvertently create a permanent establishment in the UK um, for individuals working here that ordinarily work for overseas um, entities. Um, I think the uh, HMRC will be relatively lenient if it's on a. Sh it has to be. There has to be a degree of permanency in terms of what this person is doing. So if during the obviously the hopefully the COVID-19 is just a temporary issue, therefore it shouldn't necessarily create a permanent establishment. But if that person decides to stay longer, then uh, potentially the uh, the uh, C19 crisis may may determine in terms of what they do. Then you may have created a, a taxable permanent establishment for corporate tax and possibly for VAT as well. But you're also, the, the flip side is, is uh, making sure what happens in your in the other way where you've got employees that were in the UK and now working a, abroad uh, at home, they might be expats, um, just making sure that you haven't inadvertently created a permanent establishment in the local jurisdiction and each country will have their own uh, 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 rules and legislation that will be dealing with this, and some might defer or some might relax their their uh, um, their uh, definitions for permanent establishment that may not be enshrined in OECD law. Um, got one more question, Claire. If that's okay um, for you. Uh, can you clarify uh, something for us? Did you say that for termination payments over thirty thousand, that the NIC payable was Class One A NIC, but collected via payroll? Um, yes, very hard to say. Yes, you are correct. That is indeed what I did say. The charge is class one A, and I see, and it is by payroll, which I know for many um, people it is it's quite unusual because it's obviously class one A, and I see, is associated with P11D um, reporting. But essentially, it's because it's an employer-only charge, and therefore you can't therefore put it within the class one NIC regime, which we see more ordinarily associate with payroll. Um, so it obviously would need to go in as a, as a line, a separate line entry, and be picked up as a class one A, you know, charge in terms of payroll parameters reports. So hopefully, you know, payroll providers and, and payroll software providers have made the necessary updates to um, allow that to happen. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, I'm conscious of time, so maybe we we have time for um, one more question. Um, and uh, this is for you, Vicky. I'm just trying to. Uh, so hopefully, the line will um, will work for you. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Just... Yeah, we can. Ah, okay. Well, right. I've moved rooms, so that's obviously how. <laughs> I'm struggling to see the question, actually, Vicky. Can, you, I think oh. you can see the question. Do you want to read it out for us? Yeah. So it was whether we've had any success with the pay now, check later claim approach. Um, yes, is the short answer. So we're aware that where you've had repayment claims, which have been stuck with HMRC for a while, so they might have been asking for more information or a bit of back and forth, so you've sent the information and, and they're being slow, which is often the way. Um, I've had HMRC agree to repay the claim with the understanding that in the future they'll look at it in more detail. Uh, that particular claim was uh, the most recent one was just under 100k, but as David said, HMRC haven't uh, explicitly said what the limit is under which they will um, take this approach to repayment claims. Um, but it's worth knowing that, you know, if you've got one sat with HMRC, there's no harm in asking, because it's a great way to get cash in quickly. Thank you, Vicky. Um, some great questions there. Thank you all for participating in, the, in those questions. It obviously makes it a lot more interesting in terms of the questions. If you conscious of time, we've only got a couple of minutes, but if you do have any further questions, um, we will be circulating the slide and slides and the recording um, after this call. Um, 
So if you have any additional questions there, please do let us know. Um, and we'd be very happy to, to answer those. Um, just uh, our contact details are at the front of the slides. And um, if you have any particular COVID-19 issues as well uh, that you wanted to look at, as um, Claire mentions, we do have a COVID-19 um, web page that you can look through, which covers not just the UK, but also has uh, a look at how uh, other countries around the world are dealing with um, C-19 as well, what the impacts of their tax changes are. Um, so we're coming to, to the end of the session. I just wanted to thank all of the uh, participants, all yourselves for, for joining today. And uh, also a big thank you to the presenters uh, for, for your time today and presenting uh, a number of issues that hopefully everyone is, uh, is dear to your heart in terms of how you can manage, um, manage through the, the C-19 impact and hopefully uh, really try to start um, looking at ways that you can get some um, uh, improved cash flow uh, from your tax perspective. So with that, I'd just like to thank you all for joining again and hope you all stay safe and well and I hope you have a great day. Thank you all.